So, just whilst he sets up, um, just got Torsten Seaman. Now, Torsten is a um, someone who came from an engineering background and has um, ended up doing lots of work in the microbial space. And one of the really good things about working in microbial space as a genome person is that microbial genomes are nice and small. So a lot of the things we've been talking about, like storage and um, size of sequencing and cost of doing genomes, is a lot smaller. So he actually gets to play with the cool toys a lot earlier than all the rest of us um, <coughs> because of that reduced genome size. So he's going to talk a little bit about what he does in that space. He's going to talk about sequencing when you're sequencing on a population level rather than an individual level, and he may even have some cool toys to show us. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks to Matt and Alan, I think. See, I was late in submitting my title, so I got my title of my talk chosen for me. It looks a bit like clickbait to me, but I'll try and do my best to honour the title I was given. So I've got a USB stick here. Um, I'm looking for a volunteer. Any, any volunteers? <laughs> no, there will be no live demo in this talk. <laughs> so um, as Matt said, well, how did I end up in bioinformatics? You've heard a lot of stories about journeys. I started a double degree, science and engineering, didn't really know what I wanted to do. I ended up focusing on the computer science. I ditched the electrical engineering. I didn't really understand circuits and soldering. So then I ended up still not knowing what I wanted to do, so I did a PhD in computer science. I did image processing and sort of data compression. Never done any biology before. And then when I finished my PhD, there was a offer, job offer going at the university. It was like the path of least resistance, and it was this new bioinformatics group. So I said yes because I was indecisive, and the rest is history. I hooked up with some biologists. They wanted to do some really simple stuff. I showed them I could automate it, and then it just snowballed. Once we realised what each other could do, we sort of synergised and... Now I'm, in, now I'm at the University of Melbourne working in microbial genomics. So what do I, most of what I do is sort of analysis on research projects and develop, the thing I really like to do is develop tools. So I'm old school. Um, I was taught Perl by one of our previous speakers, the Degust speaker, he, who is now, he's forgotten about that history, but he did teach me that. So I do most of my work in Perl, C and Bash still. Um, I believe, I, I write Unix command line tools that usually become parts of bigger pipelines. So I like tools that have clean interfaces, i.e. you should be able to run them with just one parameter, which is your data in the default case. I, they should be easy to install. So this is the way you get people to use your software in the bioinformatics community. Make them easy to use, easy to install. It sounds obvious, but most tools are not built in that way whatsoever. Um, one of my most popular tools, which surprised me, was, is called Proco, which is used for annotating genomes and bacterial genomes. And I really wrote it for me. You know, it was like the, the lazy program. It was something that I was having to do a lot, and I sort of had bits and pieces. So I decided to wrap it up into a program, released it. It's become very popular. It's used all over the place, in commercial places as well. Um, and yeah, I end, up spend up, I end up spending a lot of time maintaining it. Un unpaid maintenance, I guess which is another big problem, is, is maintenance of all these tools that we develop. So today I'm going to talk a bit, a bit something different. Most of what we've heard about today is sort of medical genomics, clinical genomics, you know, experiments on mouse and rats. I work with um, small, small creatures, bacteria. So a bacteria is a single-celled organism. So it's really just a bag. It's got a cell wall and the DNA and all the crap just floats inside this bag. There's no organelles or anything. It's got some... Gala, they're the little tails to help it move around. And really, all it does, it's the cell wall just makes sure that the biosmosis, that the pressure inside and out is all maintained and it can shuttle stuff in and out. So it's kind of the simplest we can get. And they come in all sorts of different sizes. You may recognize the name of some of these sh shapes, sorry, you may recognize some of the names of these shapes as being parts of the names of bacteria, and that's what it, it's usually to do with its shape, its morphology. Um, the bottom one here, the spirochete, is quite cool. So in this, this, this one here is um, like a vibrio or a bacillus. You notice it's got a flagella sticking out, this little the sort of the, the swimming bits. Well, this spirochete here, its flagella is inside the spiral, and it wobbles that flagella, and it's, it sort of does corkscrew movement. So bacteria have, there's quite a variety of bacteria, and they've got lots of cool features. So how small are they? Well, it's called microbiology for a reason because they're around about the size of one micron, which is one micrometer. And just to put, a, put things in context, so larger animal cells are about 10 times bigger than a bacterial cell, and a virus is sort of 10 times smaller. So that's sort of the, sort of the magnitude we're talking about. And they are the, the sort of the oldest life on Earth. So 
the common ancestor down there is something which everything else sort of, the, hypo the hypothetical common ancestor is what everything else is derived from. That common ancestor was probably very bacterial-like in nature. It was probably a single-celled organism. There's still a bit of debate on whether it ran on DNA or actually ran on RNA. It's still an open question. But bacteria, modern bacteria aren't that different probably from their ancestors. And you can see archaea are sort of another single-celled type organism. And then everything else, the eukaryotes, is everything else we know, including us there at the end. And even fungi are very close to humans. And that's one of the reasons, actually, that treating fungal infections is quite difficult in humans, because our, we are so similar to funguses. Anything that kills fungus often can, will hurt us as well. So that's why, yeah, they're harder to treat with sort of antibiotics. I've just added this just to show that our, our conference organiser there is at, he's off there at the end of the tree, and that us gingers, we are not going extinct, despite popular <laughs> opinion. So, um, some bacteria that you've probably heard of, most people have heard of E. coli, that's Escherichia E. coli, which is kind of the model organism in bacteria. And by model organism, I mean it's the one that everybody uses in the lab sort of for standard type experiments. And there's some really cool experiments with E. coli. So there's a lab in the US where he's basically been evolving E. coli for the last 40 years. So it's now up to like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of generations. And it's like acquiring tiny changes every 10 years or so. So these sort of uh, directed, these uh, undirected evolution experiments are quite interesting. You can do those with bacteria. Um, the one in the middle is a coccus shape. It's golden staph, which is sort of Staphylococcus aureus, which is a natural skin bacteria that, if it gets inside you, is no good. And the plague there, Black Death, Yersinia pestis. So that's what wiped out a third of Europe or whatever. Doesn't look that harmful, but it's, yeah, that was, still is. So, also to put things back in context, bacteria are small. So, how small? Well, the human genome there is about six billion letters. A bacterium, on average, is about three. They kind of vary from one to ten, but three is kind of a typical size. But interestingly, although it's like one or two thousandths of the size, the genome-wise, it, only, it, only ha it has only a tenth of the genes. And the reason for this is that the genes in bacteria are a little bit smaller on average, but they're also, the genome is actually used all for genes. Nearly the whole genome of bacterium, it's high, heavily optimised, it's Usually it's used only for genes, and they even overlap, so they're reusing bits of their genome for genes that overlap. So that's sort of quite a different scale we work with. So in bacterial genomics, we tend to work with smaller genomes, but we tend to have a lot more of them. So the other thing that's different about bacteria is they tend to only have one chromosome. So a human cell will have uh, 20, 26, two, copy, two times 26 plus, is that right? How many chromosomes does a human have? 23. 23. <laughs> you can tell they don't work in human genomics. Yeah, 46 chromosomes plus a mitochondria, and, right? Something like that. So bacteria tend to only have one chromosome, and it's not in a nucleus or anything. It's just free-floating there in the cell. And they're, they're, they're usually big. So they make up the bulk of the genetic material in a bacteria. But bacteria have something else that are cool, and they're called plasmids. And they're like mini chromosomes. They're usually a tenth or a hundredth of the size of a bacterium. And they're, they give a lot of the, they, I'll talk about those in the next couple of slides. So, yeah, the other thing about bacteria, of course, is that they're fast growers. So we're talking generations are about 20 minutes, as larger animals, obviously, experiments involving, you know, evolution, our human generations, say, 25 years, this is 20 minutes. So a lot's happening in a short amount of time. And so because they're not, there's no sexual reproduction, it's really just cell division, asexual reproduction, DNA is transferred vertically by just copying itself and splitting into two cells. So, but every now and then you think, well, how can it ever change? Well, one way it can change is from mutation. So occasionally in this copying process, when it splits into two, there'll be a mistake made, a spelling mistake, as we've heard before. That can, bits of DNA can be deleted, inserted. But the most common thing is where, say, a, a random letter gets changed. And that may or not actually change the behaviour of the bacteria. So that's sort of vertical transfer. But the other cool thing that bacteria can do that we can't do, although if we could do, it would be pretty useful, is horizontal transfer of DNA. So you remember I talked about the big chromosome and sort of the little plasmid. Well, some bacteria can actually swap these plasmids. So you can see in the picture there, they sort of, the two, two, the two bacteria kind of get together. It's called conjugation, and they make a copy of the plasmid. Now they both have a copy of it. 
And sometimes even in that last picture, that plasmid can actually integrate into the chromosome. So whatever was on that plasmid now becomes a permanent part of that genome. So this is what I think is the coolest part about bacteria. And actually, these plasmids are the, when you hear about uh, antibiotic resistance and these new genes coming out, what's the, these genes are usually encoded on plasmids. And that's how they're getting around so quickly. Because these plasmids, would, they, they will just sort of, they can swap between completely different species even. So it's usually antibody resistance genes and virulence genes end up on plasmids and being shared around. It's like sort of, oh, somebody, they've discovered a new weapon and they share it with all their friends. So this, you saw the tree of life picture before with Alan on it. Well, this is probably a more accurate tree of life. This sort of, the mixture of horizontal and vertical transmission. So because bacteria are swapping bits of DNA, and there's even more mechanisms for swapping than I've, uh, that I've described. The archaea and bacteria swap stuff, and there's even evidence for bits of transfer sort of between sort of bacteria and eukaryotes. So, yeah, the tree of life isn't so clear. And this sort of horizontal mix of horizontal and vertical transmission is one of the sort of confounding factors in a lot of the analysis we do in microbiology, because it's hard to know sometimes where things have come from. This is a slide that I spent a lot of time on long ago, so I wanted to put it in here anyway, because I think it's pretty cool. That's just another tree. <laughs> So, at the, so far I've talked about individual bacteria and the thing that, that's sort of the hot topic over the last few years has been sort of the microbiome. So, well, bacteria are everywhere. So, even a, 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 a single drop of clean filtered water will have about a million bacterial cells in it, okay? It's estimated that um, the human body has about, a, we have about 100 billion cells and some large proportion of that is actually bacterial cells. So, um, there's a lot of arguing at the moment about whether that's 90% or 50%. It doesn't really matter. All we know is that there's a lot and they're doing stuff. They're not there for, they're there for a reason. And there's some number that I picked off the internet is, which is an estimate of the number of bacterial cells on the planet Earth. <laughs> and so we have these bacteria in us and we're pretty confident now that we need them to survive. So we are not a singleton organism. We, we are living in a sort of a symbiotic or sort of parasitic uh, relationship with these bacteria. So, for example, we need bacteria in our digestive system to synthesize particular nutrients. For example, many of you, for many, many of you, we, you, if you don't eat vitamin C, you'll get scurvy. But actually humans, there's only like a couple of mammals that actually don't make vitamin C themselves. I think humans and frogs or something. It's very strange. So we're not making, we lost the ability to make vitamin C for some reason. Our bacteria are making vitamin C for us if we don't eat it. The immune system. The bacteria aid our immune system. One, they actually kill pathogens that enter your body. Our exist bacteria in you actually can kill off other bacteria. Just They're not trying to do it to help us, they're just doing it to help themselves. But also, sort of having these bacteria in us is sort of helping to regulate our immune system. It's constantly testing it and so forth. And also, they help digest our food. So, when you sort of hear about you need to have fibre in your diet, what you're, that fibre isn't actually digestible by us, and some people sort of, it gets referred to as sort of an intestinal broom, which sort of cleans up stuff. But actually, down in your colon, bacteria, that's their food. That indigestible fibre is completely digestible to them, and that's what they're eating. And they're converting that into useful stuff that w our body actually uses. So, I guess what I just, that's our little friend there, Turdy, um, my fa everyone's favourite emoji. <laughs> Um, I guess well, something that sort of comes up a lot is that people think of some people think of bacteria as kind of good or bad, but really it's all about context. For example, E. coli, sort of this model organism that we study a lot, it's actually in our guts. It's in all our guts right now, and it's digesting stuff and helping us. And when it's in our digestive system, it's good. It's actually called a probiotic. Fibre that you eat is called a prebiotic. That's the food for the probiotics. But if that poo, if that E. coli through your poo gets into your bladder or something, it, it doesn't belong there and it causes havoc and then it's suddenly classified as a pathogen, okay? So with bacteria, it's all about context. We're covered with it, but if it gets into our bloodstream, that's usually when things go bad or into our mucosa. 
And these bacteria in our gut and obviously all over, so they're not living in isolation, right? Bacteria actually like to sort of clump together. A lot of bacteria love to clump together. The cocci tend to clump together into sort of, in sort of a space filling thing. They excrete proteins and gunk, which sort of form a biofilm to sort of, that they're nice and cozy in or an extracellular matrix. And even when there is a single species, it's not clonal. They don't all have exactly the same genome. They like to keep a sort of a mixture of genomes. They're, there might have been some mutations, and they, those guys hang around, you know. They might be a bit faulty, but then, then the environment changes, say. You start getting comfy with antibiotics, or you get sick and you don't eat for a week. Well, those sort of underperformers in that environment might suddenly become good performers later on. And so our body, body always keeps this sort of, these sort of niches that are there, just, you know, and they get used when they sometimes become useful. And also, these bacteria sort of Although they don't live in ice, they like to live next to each other, they actually do communicate. So they excrete chemicals and molecules to coordinate their gene regulation, and this is called quorum sensing. So they can sort of, when they're starting, when they, when they lose, yeah, they just communicate. They're not, they're not living in isolation. They may even use Twitter. <laughs> so I guess one of the most well-studied biomes is sort of the gut microbiome. Um, this graph here is sort of just showing each of the, each, each, the columns across are sort of time and the, the colour area is sort of, sort of prevalence of particular sort of types of bacteria. And you can see that even over a 72 hour period, things can change quite a lot. And sort of the health of the host, us, and our, even our diet will change things like dramatically. If you actually stop eating fibre, some of these bacteria will just die off and you potentially will never recover them again. You'll never have them back again. So that's part of the reason a healthy diet is, it's not just the nutrients in there, it's feed, you're feeding a bacteria. And so what's clear is that the gut microbiome, a healthy gut microbiome is pretty diverse. So and when I say diverse, I don't actually mean just bacteria. So what, the ones that always seem to get forgotten are sort of the fungi and like yeasts and things and the viruses, and even, say, nematodes and the intestinal worms can often have positive benefits to people's health. So we're really thinking of the gut. The gut itself is a, is a you know, huge endocrine organ which makes peptides and hormones, but really the, the bacterial community living there is also part of that organ. Yep, thanks. And when, when that, when, and when that, um, when that bacterial get, community gets disrupted, say you take a course of antibiotics, or you go on some kind of bender and don't eat anything good for a month, you, what happens is you get this dysbiosis. And dysbiosis basically means a microbial imbalance on or inside the body. And we're focusing on gut bacteria here, so inside the body. So basically what that means there in the picture, you've got your nice diverse flora, you do something that kills off most of them, and then when you sort of come back, that diversity isn't there anymore, and what grows back is what was sort of the survivors. And now we've got this sort of dysbiosis, this imbalance. And this imbalance, fixing this imbalance has become sort of a new type of medical treatment. And I guess the most successful example to date is curing Clostridium difficile infection. So this is a sort of a, Clostridium difficile is a bacteria. It's, it's in your gut most of the time, but it can sometimes get out of control and take over, and that's bad. So how they've managed to fix that with 90, about 90% 90 success rate, uh, you can get it done here, they're doing it here in Australia now as well, is to actually do a, a, like a faecal transplant, so a transputation as it's called. So that means taking faecal matter from, well, the actual bacteria, from a healthy individual, a healthy donor, and transplanting it to you. It can be done either by like an enema every day for say five days, or some, you can take, you can get like capsules that you swallow every day that survive to the lower goal. So it's not, not the most pleasant thing to talk about, but for people that have had C. diff infections and have gone on treatments and have no success and they get this and symptoms abate in two days, like I would eat poo for that. <laughs> Other things that you sort of probably hear about in the news, and there's, sort of, there's lots of experimentation going in a lot in terms of um, metabolic syndrome and weight loss and propensity to weight gain. If, is there a microbiome component to that? And there probably is. We just don't know how strong it is. But there's, there's lots of people doing experiments where they, they breed up sort of fat mice and skinny mice, and then they swap their flora. They kill off all their flora with antibiotics. Then they 
transplant from each other and they actually start to lose or gain weight. So these are very controlled experiments under particular conditions and they're mice. So we don't really know how to translate to humans, but there's definitely something there. Microbiota definitely have a big role in human health. So I haven't got too much time left, so I just wanted to talk about where, where are we going with all this. So in the old days we were sequencing one gene, you know, then we started sequencing the genome, well, now there's a thousand genome project, the UK 100K genome project. Obviously we're going to start sequencing everybody's genome at birth maybe, we'll probably be sequencing their genomes regularly throughout life to see if any mutations have been introduced. I don't see any reason why we might not be doing like daily microbiome profiles. So you could, you might have samples of your skin or your gut sampled, analysed and stored and looking for major changes sort of to indicate any potential problems ahead. So how would we go about this? So you've heard about all this sequencing technology. It's still pretty expensive, you know, there's a big capital expenditure. They're not portable. You sort of have to send stuff to them, wait a while and then you get your data back. They take a little while to run. So Lavinia talked about this device called the Oxford Nanopore Mi9. So I've got one here to pass around so you can have a look. This is a sequencer. This is a genome sequencer. So it's USB. There's even a gold-plated USB cable in there, high fidelity. So pass that around. That is, that is actually a genome sequencer that works. So you can see it's pretty small. This in the picture there in the little hand there, that's actually like a, the, lab the lab preparation add-on. So that sits on top of the device. It's still in beta at the moment, but it's got all microfluidics and can be controlled and programmed to sort of prepare all the samples for you in the field. In real so nanopores, I won't go into too much detail, but it basically actually sequences individual molecules directly. It unzips the DNA, pulls it through a pore, there's a voltage chain change and a signal measured and then that's converted into actual bases. Now this is, why is this different? What, what's different about this sort of device? Why is this sort of a disruptive technology? Well, the data's provided in real time. Like, as it's going through the pore, you can get the data. It can sequence quite long, and it's adjustable. So, there's a, on the new version of that, there's actually an ASIC that can run, it runs Python natively. I don't know why they chose Python, but it runs Python in, silic, in silicon. And you can use that to read the data, to get access to the data that's coming through the pores and make decisions. So if the, there's hundreds of these pores on, thousands of these pores on the device, so if there's a molecule coming through, you can sort of look at the start of the read and sort of analyze what's in it and then say, actually, I don't want to resequence the rest of this molecule. I've already seen stuff like this. You can apply a negative voltage and eject it. Also, you can pause sequencing. You just say, oh, I want to pause. I've, We've sequenced enough, let's pause this experiment. We'll go and do some offline stuff and then we can come back and continue. So this is like a whole new way of sequencing. It's no longer this batch mode, it's sort of real time interactive. Obviously it's portable and it has no moving parts, so it's great for field work. And what are the applications? So the top left there is, it was in the Ebola crisis recently in Africa, minines were taken. They could pack a minine and some basic lab equipment into a bag and they took it to, uh, Guinea, and they, would, they were sequencing the Ebola virus samples in real time, and actually decisions about quarantine and light were actually made from the data from those sequencing runs. So it actually was used. The other thing is, because uh, in the UK, in uh, Nottingham, they've used it in the clinic, in a hospital where they took samples from a patient, and within 15 minutes they identified the particular bacteria that was in the, infecting the bloodstream. Within 15 minutes they could do that. They didn't get lots of data, but there was just enough data to make a unique match to stuff in the database. But I can't see why not versions of this type of device in the future at your GP. If it's quick enough to get a test done in the time you're sitting in the GP, which is what, 10, 15 minutes if you're lucky, then that would be sort of revolutionary. You wouldn't have to, at the moment, the doctor usually says, eh, not sure if it's a virus or a bacterial infection, we'll send it off. And they put you on antibiotics already, right? They put you on antibiotics just in case. Antibiotics aren't that good for your gut microbiome, so if you don't need them, we don't really want to take them. So ideally, we would want to make the correct decision now. And this is very important in terms of antibiotic stewardship, which, you know, the overuse of antibiotics and minimizing and targeting our use of antibiotics. The other thing where the application is obviously the food industry and agriculture. If we can test things in real time, food safety is going to be something that's not done random sampling. You could just do it continuously. 
And I guess the water supply, I could foresee having one of these things installed on your toilet, like I said, that somehow could measure your output every day and send you an SMS if things aren't looking great. <laughs> Mate? The convey about going to the toilet. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I mean, it could be in your toothbrush. I mean, anything. I mean, we got it. If thinking ahead, I mean, that's where it's heading. Um, this is the promethine. This is basically what what's being passed around there. This is a large scale version of that. It's basically got 48 of those on there, and when it's up fully up running at full capacity, it's generating 400 terabases of data a week. So yeah, it's insane. I'm not going to talk long about bioinformatics because lots of people talked about that today. Um, but I guess the main thing to take away from all this is that we're not going to keep all this data. We're not keeping 400 terabytes a week coming off. We need to start thinking more about sort of streaming algorithms or streaming analysis. So kind of digesting all that data in real time or, and condensing it into something we can keep and we throw away the rest. Like Matt said, sometimes it's cheaper to keep the samples and resequence if you need the data. That's kind of becoming more and more true. So in this field, there's lots of new applications, scope for method development, and um, even like on the hardware side, sort of the software processing side, the analysis side, because this data is quite different to all the genomic data we currently get, like everything's longer, the error rate's a bit higher, we've had to rethink a lot of the algorithms and techniques we use. You can't just use, it, use the existing ones. So in summary, I'll reuse the Uncle Sam slide that Lavinia had. If any of you are considering a career change, I would encourage you to consider bioinformatics. Um, I didn't intend to go into it. Most of us didn't intend to go in it. We moved into it and we love it. So yeah, thanks for listening. And if you want to contact me, you can get me there. Thanks. <laughs> any questions? Thanks, Torsten. That was an excellent talk. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I was just going to make one comment on the Ebola crisis. So apparently, uh, Iron Torrent also did some sequencing. So what the guy rocked up with a backpack for the uh, Min Iron, two trucks turned up for the Iron Torrent sequencing. So it's a comparison of the... Uh, yeah, there were some photos of them packing a tr uh, traditional sequencing instrument into the aeroplane. I didn't realize that was an Iron Torrent. So it's a competitor machine. So it's quite good in terms of you can get stuff up and running fast. But the machine is still big, yeah. But yeah, it's amazing as you can see how small it is. <laughs> Hopefully I can get that back to eventually. <laughs> it's not worth much on the open market because you can't get the flow cells that are inside it unless you're part of the program and it's all tied to your serial number and stuff. So. Just to add to that, that the um, all even the new aluminum machines are, you know, the, their latest release is a small lab machine that's designed for a single lab to use. Um, so what was, you know, large sequencing centres like AJRF is now moving a lot more towards the the small um, application in, you know, close to where the the samples are being generated rather than somewhere else. So that's just still not taking it into the Amazon rainforest with a laptop and running it off battery power, like. Yeah. It's, just, it's amazing, really. Okay. Thanks. Um, so, um, Torsten was our last speaker for the day, so I'd like to thank Torsten and all our other speakers throughout the day.